Greetings, listeners. We're back once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos. Its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits like the dreamlands, or things of a weird nature, or things that are lovecrafty and leaning. Weird fiction, science fiction, horror, learn of terrible meetings in lonely places, of cyclopean ruins, and vast staircases that lead down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that lead through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. From the creation of our galaxy to the death of the sun, this is an exploration of the Cthulhu mythos from the perspective of humans' concept of history. We are the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. You can find us at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Season 8. This episode is brought to you by FoundOutInClothing.com and BunnySlippers.com. Subscribe to PGTTCM with D.B. Spitzer and Seraphie wherever you wherever you subscribe to podcasts. We use Podbean and Apple Podcasts personally. Check out our new website over at www.pgttcm.com. Check out the new PGTTCM uh, merch over at pgttcm.threadless.com. Follow on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as PGTTCM, and YouTube as People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Edited by Daniel Spitzer, music by Kevin McLeod. Help the show out by sharing, rating, and five-star giving wherever you listen and rate podcasts. Support the show by hitting the patron button at pgttcm.com or pgttcm.podbean.com or by going to paypal.me slash pgttcm. Again, cool shirts at pgttcm.threadless.com. PGTTCM is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Check them out at darkmyths.org. The Sword of... Well, Arian and Other Stories is the third book by Irish fantasy writer Lord Dunsany. Considered a major influence on the work of Tolkien, Lovecraft, Le Guin, and others, it was first published in hardcover by George Allen and Sons in October 1908, so about 100 years ago, for anyone who's uh, keeping track, about 110 years ago, for anyone who's keeping track with math skills. And this is read by... Ed Humpal, Alex Clark, Lean Tipping, Alex D, and Kevin D, Jara Samar, Steve Vito, Asef Koss, Rosalind Carlisle, and Sandra. All right, let's get going. Enjoy this, Lord Dunsany, for this second or third week of October, as we are part of. Lord Dunsany's untitled October extravaganza for the month of October, because Daniel didn't come up with a catchy title. Month of October. All right, on with the show. The Sword of Welleran and Other Stories by Lord Dunsany. Section 10. The Fortress Unvanquishable save for Sacknoth. In a wood older than record, a foster brother of the hills, stood the village of Alathurion, and there was peace between the people of that village and all the folk who walked in the dark ways of the wood, whether they were human, or of the tribes of the beasts, or of the race of the fairies and the elves and the little sacred spirits of trees and streams. Moreover, the village people had peace among themselves, and between them and their lord, Lorendiac. In front of the village was a wide and grassy space, 
and beyond this the great wood again. But at the back the trees came right up to the houses, which, with their great beams and wooden framework and thatched roofs, green with moss, seemed almost to be a part of the forest. Now, in the time I tell of, there was trouble in Alithurion, for of an evening fell dreams were wont to come slipping through the tree trunks and into the peaceful village, and they assumed dominion of men's minds and led them in watches of the night through the cindery plains of hell. Then the magician of that village made spells against those fell dreams, yet still the dreams came flitting through the trees as soon as dark had fallen, and led men's minds by night into terrible places, and caused them to praise Satan openly with their lips. And men grew afraid of sleep in Alithuria, and they grew worn and pale, some through the want of rest, and others from fear of the things they saw on the cindery plains of hell. Then the magician of the village went up into the tower of his house, and all night long those whom fear kept awake could see his window high up in the night, glowing softly alone. The next day, when the twilight was far gone and night was gathering fast, the magician went away to the forest's edge and uttered there a spell that he had made. The spell was a compulsive, terrible thing, having a power over evil dreams and over spirits of ill. For it was a verse of forty lines in many languages, both living and dead, and had in it the word wherewith the people of the plains are wont to curse their camels, and the shout wherewith the wailers of the north lure the whales shoreward to be killed, and a word that causes elephants to trumpet, and every one of the forty lines closed with a rhyme for wasp. And still the dreams came flitting through the forest, and led men's souls into the plains of hell. Then the magician knew that the dreams were from Gaznak. Therefore he gathered the people of the village, and told them that he had uttered his mightiest spell, a spell having power over all that were human, or of the tribes of the beasts. And that since it had not availed, the dreams must come from Gaznak, the greatest magician, among the spaces of the stars. And he read to the people out of the Book of Magicians, which tells the comings of the comet and foretells his coming again. And he told them how Gaznak rides upon the comet, and how he visits earth once in every two hundred and thirty years, and makes for himself a vast, invincible fortress, and sends out dreams to feed on the minds of men, and may never be vanquished but by the sword Saknath and a cold fear fell on the hearts of the villagers when they found that their magician had failed them. Then spake Leothric, son of the Lord Lorendiac, and twenty years old was he. Good master, what of the sword Saknath? And the village magician answered, Fair lord, no such sword as yet is wrought, for it lies as yet in the hide of Tharagavarug, protecting his spine. Then said Leothric, Who is Tharagavarug, and where may he be encountered? And the magician of Alithurion answered, He is the dragon crocodile who haunts the northern marshes and ravages the homesteads by their marge. And the hide of his back is of steel, and his underparts are of iron, but along the midst of his back, over his spine, there lies a narrow strip of unearthly steel. This strip of steel is Sacknoth, and it may be neither cleft nor molten, and there is nothing in the world that may avail to or break it, or even leave a scratch upon its surface. It is of the length of a good sword, and of the breadth thereof. Shouldst thou prevail against Tharagavarug, his hide may be melted away from Sacknoth in a furnace. But there is only one thing that may sharpen Sacknoth's edge and this is one of Tharagavarug's own steel eyes. And the other eye thou must fasten to Sacknoth's hilt, and it will watch for thee. But it is a hard task to vanquish Tharagavarug, for no sword can pierce his hide. We'd like to thank you for listening to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, our sponsor is bunnyslippers.com, your finest source of 
wonderful Cthulhu slippers, and cool, cool shirts from founditemclothing.com, your favorite shirts from your favorite cult films, and also these fine folks. His back cannot be broken, and he can neither burn nor drown. In one way only can Tharagavarug die, and that is by starving. Then sorrow fell upon Leothric, but the magician spoke on. If a man drive Thargavarug away from his food with a stick for three days, he will starve on the third day at sunset. And though he is not vulnerable, yet in one spot he may take hurt, for his nose is only of lead. A sword would merely lay bare the uncleavable bronze beneath, but if his nose be smitten constantly, with a stick he will always recoil from the pain, and thus may Tharagavarug, to left and right, be driven away from his food. Then Leothric said, What is Tharagavarug's food? And the magician of Alathurian said, His food is men. But Leothric went straight away thence, and cut a great staff from a hazel tree, and slept early that evening. But the next morning, awakening from troubled dreams, he arose before the dawn, and, taking with him provisions for five days, set out through the forest northwards toward the marshes. For some hours he moved through the gloom of the forest, and when he emerged from it the sun was above the horizon, shining on pools of water in the wasteland. Presently he saw the claw marks of Tharagavarug deep in the soil, and the track of his tail between them like a furrow in a field. Then Leothric followed the tracks, till he heard the bronze heart of Tharagavarug before him, booming like a bell. And Tharagavarug, it being the hour when he took the first meal of the day, was moving toward a village with his heart tolling. And all the people of the village were come out to meet him, as it was their wont to do, for they abode not the suspense of awaiting Tharagavarug, and of hearing him sniffing brazenly as he went from door to door, pondering slowly in his metal mind what habitant he would choose. And none dared to flee, for in the days when the villagers fled from Tharagavarug, he, having chosen his victim, would track him tirelessly, like a doom. Nothing availed them against Tharagavarug. Once they climbed the trees when he came, but Tharagavarug went up to one, arching his back and leaning over slightly, and rasped against the trunk until it fell. And when Leothric came near, Tharagavarug saw him out of one of his small steel eyes, and came towards him leisurely, and the echoes of his heart swirled up through his open mouth. And Leothric stepped sideways from his onset, and came between him and the village, and smote him on the nose and the blow of the stick made a dint in the soft lead. And Tharagavarug swung clumsily away, uttering one fearful cry like the sound of a great church bell that had become possessed of a soul that fluttered upward from the tombs at night, an evil soul, giving the bell a voice. Then he attacked Leothric, snarling, and again Leothric leapt aside and smote him on the nose with his stick. Tharagavarug uttered like a bell howling, and when the dragon crocodile attacked him, or turned toward the village, Leothric smote him again. So all day Leothric drove the monster with a stick, and he drove him farther and farther from his prey, with his heart tolling angrily, and his voice crying out for pain. Towards evening Tharagavarug ceased to snap at Leothric, but ran before him to avoid the stick, for his nose was sore and shining and in the gloaming the villagers came out and danced to cymbal and psaltery. When Tharagavarug heard the cymbal and psaltery, hunger and anger came upon him, and he felt as some lord might feel who was held by force from the banquet in his own castle, and heard the creaking spit go round and round and the good meat crackling on it. And all that night he attacked Leothric fiercely, and oft times nearly caught him in the darkness for his gleaming eyes of steel could see as well by night as by day. And Leothric gave ground slowly till the dawn. And when the light came, they were near the village again, yet not so near to it as they had been when they encountered, 
for Leothric drove Tharagavarag farther in the day than Tharagavarag had forced him back in the night. Then Leothric drove him again with his stick, till the hour came that it was the custom of the dragon crocodile to find his man. One third of his man he would eat at the time he found him, and the rest at noon and evening. But when the hour came for finding his man, a great fierceness came upon Tharagavarug, and he grabbed rapidly at Leothric, but could not seize him, and for a long while neither of them would retire. But at last the pain of the stick on his leaden nose overcame the hunger of the dragon crocodile, and he turned from it howling. From that moment Thargavarag weakened. All that day Leothric drove him with his stick, and at night both held their ground, and when the dawn of the third day was come the heart of Thargavarag beat slower and fainter. It was as though a tired man was ringing up bell. Once Tharagavarag nearly seized a frog, but Leothric snatched it away just in time. Towards noon the dragon crocodile lay still for a long while, and Leothric stood near him and leaned on his trusty stick. He was very tired and sleepless, but had more leisure now for eating his provisions. With Tharagavarag the end was coming fast, and in the afternoon his breath came hoarsely, rasping in his throat. It was as the sound of many huntsmen blowing blasts on horns, and toward evening his breath came faster but fainter, like the sound of a hunt going furious to the distance and dying away, and he made desperate rushes toward the village, but Leothric still leapt about him, battering his leaden nose. Scarce audible now at all was the sound of his heart. It was like a church bell tolling beyond hills for the death of someone unknown and far away. Then the sun set, and flamed in the village windows, and a chill went over the world, and in some small garden a woman sang. And Tharagavarag lifted up his head and starved, and his life went from his invulnerable body, and Leothric lay down beside him and slept. And later, in the starlight, the villagers came out and carried Leothric, sleeping, to the village, all praising him in whispers as they went. They laid him down upon a couch in a house, and danced outside in silence, without psaltery or cymbal. And the next day, rejoicing, to Alathurion they hauled the dragon crocodile, and Leothric went with them, holding his battered staff, and a tall, broad man, who was the smith of Alathurion, made a great furnace, and melted Tharagavarag away, till only Sacknoth was left, gleaming among the ashes. Then he took one of the small eyes that had been chiseled out, and filed an edge on Sacknoth, and gradually the steel eye wore away, facet by facet, but ere it was quite gone it had sharpened redoubtably Sacknoth. But the other eye they set in the butt of the hilt, and it gleamed there bluely. And that night Leothric arose in the dark and took the sword and went westwards to find Gaznak. And he went through the dark forest till the dawn, and all the morning, and till the afternoon. But in the afternoon he came into the open, and saw in the midst of the land where no man goeth, the fortress of Gaznak, mountainous before him, little more than a mile away. And Leothric saw that the land was marsh and desolate. And the fortress went up all white out of it, and many buttresses, and was broad below but narrowed higher up, and was full of gleaming windows with the light upon them. And near the top of it a few white clouds were floating, but above them some of its pinnacles reappeared. Then Leothric advanced into the marshes, and the eye of Tharagavarag looked out warily from the hilt of Sakna, for Tharagavarag had known the marshes well, and the sword nudged Leothric to the right, or pulled to the left, away from the dangerous places, and so brought him safely to the fortress walls. And in the wall stood doors like precipices of steel, all studded with boulders of iron, and above every window were terrible gargoyles of stone, and the name of the fortress shone on the wall, writ large in letters of brass, the fortress unvanquishable, save for Sacknoth. Then Leothric drew and revealed Sacknoth, 
and all the gargoyles grinned, and the grin went flickering from face to face right up into the cloud-abiding gables. And when Sacknoth was revealed and all the gargoyles grinned, it was like the moonlight emerging from a cloud to look for the first time upon a field of blood, and passing swiftly over the wet faces of the slain that lie together in the horrible night. Then Leothric advanced toward a door, and it was mightier than the marble quarry Sacramona, from which of old men cut enormous slabs to build the Abbey of the Holy Tears. Day after day they wrenched out the very ribs of the hill until the Abbey was builded, and it was more beautiful than anything in stone. Then the priests blessed Sacramona, and it had rest, and no more stone was ever taken from it to build the houses of men and the hills stood looking southward, lonely in the sunlight, defaced by that mighty scar. So vast was the door of steel. And the name of the door was the Port Resonant, the way of egress for war. Then Leothric smote upon the Port Resonant with Sacknoth, and the echo of Sacknoth went ringing through the hills, and all the dragons in the forest barked, and when the baying of the remotest dragon had faintly joined in the tumult, a window opened far up among the clouds below the twilight gables, and a woman screamed, and far away in hell her father heard her and knew that her doom was come. And Leothric went on smiting terribly with Sacknoth, and the grey steel of the port resonant, the way of egress for war, that was tempered to resist the swords of the world, came away in ringing slices. Then Leothric, holding Sacknoth in his hand, went in through the hole he had hewn in the door, and came into the unlit, cavernous hall. An elephant fled trumpeting, and Leothric stood still, holding Sacknoth. When the sound of the feet of the elephant had died away, in remoter corridors, nothing more stirred, and the cavernous hall was still. Presently the darkness of the distant halls became musical, with the sound of bells all coming nearer and nearer. Still Leothric waited in the dark, and the bells rang louder and louder, echoing through the halls, and there appeared a procession of men on camels, riding two by two from the interior of the fortress. And they were armed with scimitars of Assyrian make, and were all clad with mail, and chain mail hung from their helmets about their faces, and flapped as the camels moved and they all halted before Leothric in the cavernous hall, and the camel bells clanged and stopped, and the leader said to Leothric, The Lord Gaznak has desired to see you die before him. Be pleased to come with us, and we can discourse by the way of the manner in which the Lord Gaznak has desired to see you die. And as he said this, he unwound a chain of iron that was coiled upon his saddle. And Leothric answered, I would fain go with you, for I am come to slay Gaznak. Then all the camel guard of Gaznak laughed hideously, disturbing the vampires that were asleep in the measureless vault of the roof. And the leader said, The Lord Gaznak is immortal, save for Sacknoth, and weareth armor that is proof even against Sacknoth himself, and hath a sword the second most terrible in the world. Then Leothric said, I am the lord of the sword Sacknoth. And he advanced toward the camel guard of Gaznak, and Sacknoth lifted up and down in his hand as though stirred by an exultant pulse. Then the camel guard of Gaznak fled, and the riders leaned forward and smote their camels with whips, and they went away with a great clamor of bells to the colonnades and corridors and vaulted halls, and scattered into the inner darkness of the fortress. When the last sound of them had died away, Leothric was in doubt which way to go, for the camel guard was dispersed in many directions. So he went straight on, till he came to a great stairway in the midst of the hall. Then Leothric set his foot in the middle of a wide step, and climbed steadily up the stairway for five minutes. Little light was there in the great hall through which Leothric ascended, for it only entered through arrow slits here and there and in the world outside evening was waning fast. The stairway led up to two folding doors, and they stood a little ajar, and through the crack Leothric entered, and tried to continue straight on, but could get no farther, 
for the whole room seemed to be full of festoons of ropes which swung from wall to wall and were looped and draped from the ceiling. The whole chamber was thick and black with them. They were soft and light to the touch like fine silk, but Leothric was unable to break any one of them, and though they swung away from him as he pressed forward, yet by the time he had gone three yards they were all about him like a heavy cloak. Then Leothric stepped back and drew Sacknoth, and Sacknoth divided the ropes without a sound, and without a sound the severed pieces fell to the floor. Leothric went forward slowly, moving Sacknoth in front of him up and down as he went. When he was come into the middle of the chamber, suddenly, as he parted with Sacknoth a great hammock of strands, he saw a spider before him that was larger than a ram, and the spider looked at him with eyes that were little but in which there was much sin, and said, Who are you that spoil the labor of years all done to the honor of Satan? And Leothric answered, I am Leothric, son of Lorendiac. And the spider said, I will make a rope at once to hang you with. Then Leothric parted another bunch of strands, and came nearer to the spider as he sat making his rope, and the spider looking up from his work, said, What is that sword which is able to sever my ropes? And Leothric said, It is Sacknoth. Thereat the black hair that hung over the face of the spider parted to left and right, and the spider frowned. Then the hair fell back into its place and hid everything except the sin of the little eyes which went on gleaming lustfully in the dark. But before Leothric could reach him, he climbed away with his hands, going up by one of his ropes to a lofty rafter, and there sat, growling. But, clearing his way with Sacknoth, Leothric passed through the chamber, and came to the farther door. And the door being shut, and the handle far up out of his reach, he hewed his way through it with Sacknoth, in the same way as he had through the port resonant, the way of egress for war. And so Leothric came into a well-lit chamber, where queens and princes were banqueting together, all at a great table, and thousands of candles were glowing all about, and their light shone in the wine that the princes drank, and on the huge golden candelabra, and the royal faces were irradiant with the glow, and the white tablecloth, and the silver plates, and the jewels in the hair of the queens, each jewel having an historian all to itself who wrote no other chronicles all his days. Between the table and the door there stood two hundred footmen in rows of one hundred facing one another. Nobody looked at Leothric as he entered through the hole in the door, but one of the princes asked a question of a footman, and the question was passed from mouth to mouth by all the hundred footmen till it came to the last one nearest Leothric, and he said to Leothric, without looking at him, What do you seek here? And Leothric answered, I seek to slay Gaznak. And footman to footman repeated all the way to the table, He seeks to slay Gaznak. And another question came down the line of footmen, What is your name? And the line that stood opposite took his answer back. Then one of the princes said, Take him away, where we shall not hear his screams. And footmen repeated it to footmen until it came to the last two, and they advanced to seize Leothric. Then Leothric showed to them his sword, saying, This is Sacknoth. And both of them said to the man nearest, It is Sacknoth, then screamed and fled away. And two by two, all up the double line, footman to footman repeated, It is Sacknoth, then screamed and fled, till the last two gave the message to the table, and all the rest had gone. Hurriedly then arose the queens and princes, and fled out of the chamber. And the goodly table, when they were all gone, looked small, and disorderly, and awry. And to Leothric, pondering in the desolate chamber by what door he should pass onwards, there came from far away the sounds of music, and he knew that it was the magical musicians playing to Gaznak while he slept. Then Leothric, walking towards the distant music, passed out by the door opposite to the one through which he had cloven his entrance, and so passed into a chamber vast as the other, in which were many women weirdly beautiful. And they all asked him of his quest, 
and when they heard that it was to slay Gaznak, they all besought him to tarry among them, saying that Gaznak was immortal save for Sacknoth, and also that they had need of a knight to protect them from the wolves that rushed round and round the wainscot all night, and sometimes broke in upon them through the mouldering oak. Perhaps Leothric had been tempted to tarry had they been human women, for theirs was a strange beauty but he perceived that instead of eyes they had little flames that flickered in their sockets, and knew them to be the fevered dreams of Gaznak. Therefore he said, I have business with Gaznak and with Sacknoth, and passed on through the chamber. And at the name of Sacknoth those women screamed, and the flames of their eyes sank low and dwindled to sparks. And Leothric left them, and, hewing with Sacknoth, passed through the farther door. Outside he felt the night air on his face, and found that he stood upon a narrow way between two abysses. To left and right of him, as far as he could see, the walls of the fortress ended in a profound precipice, though the roof still stretched above him, and before him lay two abysses full of stars, for they cut their way through the whole earth and revealed the under sky and threading its course between them went the way, and it sloped upward and its sides were sheer. And beyond the abysses, where the way led up to the farther chambers of the fortress, Leothric heard the musicians playing their magical tune. So he stepped on to the way, which was scarcely a stride in width, and moved along it holding Sacknoth naked. And to and fro beneath him in each abyss whirred the wings of vampires passing up and down, all giving praise to Satan as they flew. Presently he perceived the dragon Thok lying on the way, pretending to sleep, and his tail hung down into one of the abysses. And Leothric went towards him, and when he was quite close, Thok rushed at Leothric. And he smote deep with Sacknoth and Thok tumbled into the abyss, screaming, and his limbs made a whirring in the darkness as he fell, and he fell till his scream sounded no louder than a whistle, and then could be heard no more. Once or twice Leothric saw a star blink for an instant and reappear again, and this momentary eclipse of a few stars was all that remained in the world of the body of Thok. And Lunk, the brother of Thok, who had lain a little behind him, saw that this must be Sacknoth, and fled lumbering away. And all the while that he walked between the abysses, the mighty vault of the roof of the fortress still stretched over Leothric's head, all filled with gloom. Now, when the further side of the abyss came into view, Leothric saw a chamber that opened with innumerable arches upon the twin abysses, and the pillars of the arches went away into the distance, and vanished in the gloom to left and right. Far down the dim precipice on which the pillars stood, he could see windows small and closely barred, and between the bars there showed at moments, and disappeared again, things that I shall not speak of. There was no light here except for the great southern stars that shone below the abysses, and here and there in the chamber through the arches lights that moved furtively without the sound of a footfall. Then Leothric stepped from the way, and entered the great chamber. Even to himself he seemed but a tiny dwarf, as he walked under those colossal arches. The last faint light of evening flickered through a window painted in sombre colors commemorating the achievements of Satan upon earth. High up in the wall the window stood, and the streaming lights of candles lower down moved steadily away. Other light there was none save for a faint blue glow from the steel eye of Tharagavarag that peered restlessly about it from the hilt of Sacknoth. Heavily in the chamber hung the clammy odor of a large and deadly beast. Leothric moved forward slowly with the blade of Sacknoth in front of him, feeling for a foe, and the eye in the hilt of it looking out behind. Nothing stirred. If anything lurked, behind the pillars of the colonnade that held aloft the roof, it neither breathed nor moved. The music of the magical musicians sounded very near. Suddenly the great doors on the far side of the chamber opened to left and right. For some moments Leothric saw nothing move, and waiting clutched Sacknoth. Then Wong 
Bongarak came toward him, breathing. This was the last and faithfulest guard of Gaznak, and came from slobbering just now his master's hand. More as a child than a dragon was Gaznak wont to treat him, giving him often in his fingers tender pieces of man, all smoking from his table. Long and low was Wong Bongarak, and subtle about the eyes, and he came breathing malice against Leothric out of his faithful breast, and behind him roared the armory of his tail, as when sailors drag the cable of the anchor all rattling down the deck. And well Wong Bongarak knew that he now faced Sacknoth, for it had been his wont to prophesy quietly to himself for many years as he lay curled at the feet of Gaznak. And Leothric stepped forward into the blast of his breath, and lifted Sacknoth to strike. But when Sacknoth was lifted up, the eye of Tharagavarag in the butt of the hilt beheld the dragon and perceived his subtlety. For he opened his mouth wide, and revealed to Leothric the ranks of his sabre teeth, and his leather gums flapped upwards. But while Leothric made to smite at his head, he shot forward scorpion-wise over his head the length of his armoured tail. All this the eye perceived in the hilt of Sacknoth, who smote suddenly sideways. Not with the edge smoke Sacknoth, for had he done so, the severed end of the tail had still come hurtling on, as some pine tree that the avalanche has hurled point foremost from the cliff right through the broad breast of some mountaineer. So had Leothric been transfixed. But Sacknoth smote sideways with the flat of his blade, and sent the tail whizzing over Leothric's left shoulder, and it rasped upon his armor as it went, and left a groove upon it. Sideways then at Leothric smote the foiled tail of Wong Bongarak, and Sacknoth parried, and the tail went shrieking up the blade and over Leothric's head. Then Leothric and Wong Bongarak fought sword to tooth, and the sword smote as only Sacknoth can, and the evil faithful life of Wong Bongarak the dragon went out through the wide wound. Then Leothric walked on past that dead monster, and the armored body still quivered a little. And for a while it was like all the plowshares in a county working together in one field behind tired and struggling horses. Then the quivering ceased, and Wong Bongarak lay still to rust. And Leothric went on through the open gates, and Sacknoth dripped quietly along the floor. By the open gates through which Wong Bongarak had entered, Leothric came into a corridor echoing with music. This was the first place from which Leothric could see anything above his head, for hitherto the roof had ascended to mountainous heights and had stretched indistinct into the gloom. But along the narrow corridor hung huge bells low and near to his head, and the width of each brazen bell was from wall to wall, and they were one behind the other and as he passed under each bell uttered, and his voice was mournful and deep, like the voice of a bell speaking to a man for the last time when he is newly dead. Each bell uttered once as Leothric came under it, and their voices sounded solemnly and wide apart as ceremonious intervals. For if he walked slow, these bells came closer together, and when he walked swiftly, they moved farther apart and the echoes of each bell tolling above his head went on before him whispering to the others. Once when he stopped they all jangled angrily till he went on again. Between these slow and boding notes came the sound of the magical musicians. They were playing a dirge now, very mournfully. And at last the author came to the end of the corridor of the bells, and beheld there a small black door and all the corridor behind him was full of the echoes of the tolling, and they all muttered to one another about the ceremony, and the dirge of the musicians came floating slowly through them like a procession of foreign elaborate guests, and all of them boded ill to Leothric. The black door opened at once to the hand of Leothric, and he found himself in the open air in a wide court paved with marble. High over it shone the moon, summoned there by the hand of Gaznak. There Gaznak slept, and all around him sat his magical musicians, all playing upon strings, and, even sleeping, Gaznak was clad in armor, and only his wrists and face and neck were bare. 
but the marvel of that place was the dreams of Gaznak, for beyond the wide court slept a dark abyss, and into the abyss there poured a white cascade of marble stairways, and widened out below into terraces and balconies with fair white statues on them, and descended again in a wide stairway, and came to lower terraces in the dark, where swart uncertain shapes went to and fro. All these were the dreams of Gaznak, and issued from his mind, and, becoming gleaming marble, passed over the edge of the abyss as the musicians played. And all the while out of the mind of Gaznak, lulled by that strange music, went spires and pinnacles beautiful and slender, ever ascending skywards. And the marble dreams moved slow in time to the music. When the bells tolled and the musicians played their dirge, Ugly gargoyles came out suddenly all over the spires and pinnacles, and great shadows passed swiftly down the steps and terraces, and there was hurried whisperings in the abyss. When Leothric stepped from the black door, Gaznak opened his eyes. He looked neither to the left or right, but stood up at once, facing Leothric. Then the magicians played a death spell on their strings, and there arose a humming along the blade of Sacknoth as he turned the spell aside. When Leothric dropped not down, and they heard the humming of Sacknoth, the magicians arose and fled, all wailing as they went upon their strings. Then Gaznak drew out screaming from its sheath the sword that was the mightiest in the world except for Sacknoth, and slowly walked toward Leothric, and he smiled as he walked although his own dreams had foretold his doom. And when Leothric and Gaznak came together, each looked at each, and neither spoke a word, but they smote both at once, and their swords met, and each sword knew the other, and from whence he came. And whenever the sword of Gaznak smote on the blade of Sacknoth, it rebounded gleaming as hail from off slated roofs, but whenever it fell upon the armor of Leothric, it stripped it off in sheets. And upon Gaznak's armor, Sacknoth fell oft and furiously, but ever he came back snarling, leaving no mark behind, and as Gaznak fought, he held his left hand hovering close over his head. Presently Leothric smote fair and fiercely at his enemy's neck, but Gaznak, clutching his own head by the hair, lifted it high aloft, and Sacknoth went cleaving through empty space. Then Gaznak replaced his head upon his neck, and all the while fought nimbly with his sword, and again and again Leothric swept with Sacknoth at Gaznak's bearded neck, and ever the left hand of Gaznak was quicker than the stroke, and the hand went up, and the sword rushed vainly under it. And the ringing fight went on till Leothric's armor lay all around him on the floor, and the marble was splashed with his blood, and the sword of Gaznak was notched like a saw from meeting the blade of Sacknoth. Still Gaznak stood unwounded and smiling still. At last Leothric looked at the throat of Gaznak and aimed with Sacknoth, and again Gaznak lifted his head by the hair. But not at his throat flew Sacknoth, for Leothric struck instead at the lifted hand, and through the wrist of it went Sacknoth whirring, as a scythe goes through the stem of a single flower. And bleeding, the severed hand fell to the floor, and at once blood spurted from the shoulders of Gaznok, and dripped from the fallen head, and the tall pinnacles went down into the earth, and the fair wide terraces all rolled away, and the court was gone like the dew, and a wind came, and the colonnades drifted thence, and all the colossal halls of Gaznok fell. And the abysses closed up suddenly as the mouth of a man who, having told a tale, will forever speak no more. Then Leothric looked around him in the marshes where the night mist was passing away. And there was no fortress, nor sound of dragon or mortal. Only beside him lay an old man, wizened and evil and dead, whose head and hand were severed from his body. And gradually, over the wide lands, the dawn was coming up, and ever growing in beauty as it came, like the peal of an organ played by a master's hand, growing louder and lovelier as the soul of the master warms, and at last giving praise with all its mighty voice. Then the birds sang, and Leothric went homeward, 
and left the marshes and came to the dark wood, and the light of the dawn ascending lit him upon his way. And into Alathurion he came ere noon, and with him brought the evil wizened head, and the people rejoiced, and their nights of trouble ceased. This is the tale of the vanquishing of the fortress unvanquishable save for Sacknoth, and of its passing away, as it is told and believed by those who love the mystic days of old. Others have said, and vainly claim to prove, that a fever came to Alathurion and went away, and that this same fever drove Leothric into the marshes by night and made him dream there and act violently with a sword. And others again say that there hath been no town of Alathurion, and that Leothric never lived. Peace to them. The gardener hath gathered up this autumn's leaves. Who shall see them again, or who wot of them? And who shall say what hath befallen in the days of long ago? Thank you again for joining us for The Sword of Welleran and Other Stories by Lord Dunsany. This is October, so expect this for more of October. And I hope you really enjoy the stories. And we'll figure out what we're going to do for November, but Lord Dunsany right now. Thanks again to BunnySlippers.com, FoundItemClothing.com, and DarkMyths.org. All right, have a good day. And remember, keep it weird and stay squiggly. <laughs>